Uh, thank you very much. And thanks very much to the organizers for having me here and also for Paolo for kicking off the thermodynamic session, uh, thermodynamic ideas here. So yeah, um, what I want to tell you a bit about is, um, well, my motivation the last couple of years has been looking at control rather than as a means to an end. Like very often in the community, I think we look at, we have a problem, we want to perform a particular task. How do we do it? And we optimal control or some control techniques give us that route. But I think, you know, it's not a remarkably deep insight to realize that you can turn that problem on its head and say, well, actually, if I think about the control, if I think about in particular like an adiabatic process, if I'm able to achieve an effective adiabatic dynamics using control, then I somehow, my control term somehow captures the essence of the, the path not taken in some sense. It allows me a, a different way to look at the non-equilibrium dynamics that I am essentially suppressing. And that's essentially what I'm, I'm interested in doing here. I want to see, can I make that insight a little bit more rigorous, a little bit more concrete um, by looking at a particular type of control. We'll focus on the shortcuts to adiabaticity. So I want to achieve an effective adiabatic dynamics. What you'll see everything here, I'm going to deal with a single qubit and I want to stay in the ground state, all right? So everything is super easy. It's two level systems, unitary dynamics. I'm not going to look at any open systems or anything. And I want to see if for that control system, if I were to do the dynamics without control, I would end up, uh, I can recover some non-equilibrium process which I can capture by the kibble zerk mechanism. Is there a way in which I can probe this for the control dynamics using a particular figure of merit. And what I'm interested in is studying the thermodynamics of it, in particular, looking at the quantum work statistics. So that's, that's sort of the motivation of what I'm doing. So a very quick crash course on what are shortcuts to adiabaticity. I imagine some people here know them, but essentially the adiabatic theorem gives us a recipe for how we can control a system already. What the adiabatic theorem tells us is that if uh, the transition rates between two different eigenstates in the system. If I'm driving a system time dependently, the transition rates between eigenstates is going to be related essentially to the energy gap. Big energy gaps, I can drive the system fast. Small energy gaps, I have to drive the system very slowly. If I can take the spectral decomposition of my Hamiltonian, that information can be recast into a, a way in which I can determine what, do I, what would I need to do in order to suppress all those uh, transitions from the outset. How, what do I need to evolve the system according to? What generator do I need to use that will give me an effective adiabatic dynamics regardless of how violently I'm ramping the system? So you can work through the math. It's really not too difficult. And it's this additional term, this H1 term. If I add this and I evolve my system according to the total generator H0 plus H1, I will get an effective adiabatic dynamics in arbitrarily short time. So as I said, you can do this calculation. It's like you know, a couple of lines. You can do it yourself. Looking at, uh, we're going to look at the Landau-Zener model, and you can calculate this. If I determine what this counter-diabatic term is, it drops out to be something very simple. It's just if I have uh, sigma x and sigma z, and I'm ramping the field term here, then I can achieve a perfect adiabatic dynamics by implementing a control term which is proportional to to the y. Right. So the process here then is I'm going to start somewhere here in the ground in the ground state and I want to ramp all the way through to the ground state, and I want at every instant in time for my dynamics to be adiabatic. So the system should be in the instantaneous eigenstate of the bare Hamiltonian at every instant in time. That's the, that's the problem we're looking at. If I evolve using that total Hamiltonian, uh, I get exactly this. Now, looking at that dynamics, if we think just a little bit more about the, um, the, the dynamics without implementing that control, what I said is that the adiabatic theorem tells us that if I'm driving the system too fast, I'll get these excitations. So if I start somewhere down here and I drive the system too quickly, uh, I'll get excitations up, right? Adiabatic theorem tells us that if this energy gap is really big, it makes sense that I can drive the system and I'll not get too many excitations. It's whenever the energy levels get close to each other that I'm very likely to get some bleeding between the eigenstates. If I'm somewhere here and I'm driving the system really quickly in this little region, it's, very, it's much more likely I'm going to get some excitations up here. <clears throat> so that's what the adiabatic theorem sort of tells us or hints at. We can make that idea more concrete, by, uh, and that's what comes from the kibble zurich mechanism. She sort of really, uh, really extends this idea and says, OK, well, can we make it a little bit more precise what we mean by the, the dynamical response to the system in terms of if it's adiabatic or non-adiabatic? 
And in particular, in the context of critical systems, so the details here are not important, I'm not going to go through any of this, um, it's just that if I'm driving the system and it has something like this uh, uh, a closing energy gap, there is a point in the dynamics where, depending on how fast I'm ramping the system, uh, I will transition between an effectively adiabatic region into an effectively, uh, well, what we call the impulse regime or non-adiabatic regime. And intuitively, I think you can kind of get an idea of where that transition should be. What was nice is that the Kibble-Zerk mechanism sort of formalized it. It basically said that if I'm, let's assume a linear ramp here. So if I'm ramping the system linearly, there's a point somewhere here where the blue line is essentially the inverse energy gap. There's a point where the inverse energy gap is equal to the rate at which I'm driving the system. When that happens, sort of feels intuitively right that that is about the point where the system will no longer be able to relax back down into its, into its ground state. And that's what delineates the transition between adiabatic and uh, what we call impulse regime. You can make this, and what we're going to focus on is the, that transition point, essentially the size of this impulse regime or non-adiabatic regime. Um, we want to see, can I extract that information by looking at the control dynamic, right? So this is what we know happens in the, in the non-equilibrium case. If I take my system and I just ramp it, I will be able to get something like this. The slight issue with, it, with this is that it's kind of bespoke to the type of ramp that I'm doing. Here I'm showing you it for a linear ramp. The transition between adiabatic and impulse will happen at a different time if I use a quartic ramp or some other type of ramp. So generally, like solving the non-equilibrium problem becomes quite difficult. If I can solve the general control problem, I then essentially have a recipe to study it pretty, pretty arbitrary. <clears throat> okay, I need to introduce, so that's shortcuts are covered. The, the motivation, we want to see that can we uh, establish the transition between the, the adiabatic and impulse regimes. The tool that we're going to use is the quantum work statistics. Okay. So a uh, quick two-minute crash course on what uh, quantum work is. It's a very slippery, subtle uh, concept when we're dealing with quantum systems. Again, you can kind of intuitively get an idea why when we think about how do we measure work done in, let's say, in a classical process. Generally, it's to do with energy changes, right? So if I think about how much work do I do lifting a weight from one point in to another point, I need to know the energy initially, the energy at the end. I calculate the difference, and that's essentially the work that I have done in moving that weight. The subtlety there, then, is that I have to do measurements. I need to know the energy initially. I need to know the energy finally. If my state, if my initial state is some superposition, that first energy measurement is going to collapse it into one of the energy eigenstates. So coherences are going to get washed away by learning what the energy is initially. What this means is that there is, unlike, and I find this like remarkable, unlike the fact that energy, there's a well-defined Hermitian operator associated to energy, there is not an easy extension of the same idea to work, even though it's just to do with changes in energy. In fact, this famous paper from 2007 demonstrated that work isn't an observable. It's a stochastic quantity. If I think about how I measure work, uh, it's built on this two-point two measurement protocol. Like what I said, like if I want to know how much work I've done in the process, I need to know its initial value and its final value, and then calculate the, the, the change. So I can, okay, it looks a little bit more complicated than it actually is. I can write down a, work, a probability distribution corresponding to the work that I have done. Well, you see, and the reason it's two-point measurements, I have an initial energy measurement, so I take whatever my initial state is, I do an energy measurement to find out what the initial state is. That gives me the initial value of energy. I then do my work protocol, where for us, everything is going to be unitary. So I unitarily evolve that first measurement outcome, and then I determine what the final energy is by measuring what state it is at the end. This unitary is very likely going to put the system again into a superposition of all of the different final energy eigenstates. So again, it'll essentially randomly select one of them based on my measurement. And that will give me my last value of, of energy. And then this is what the work is. So it's a classical probability distribution based on a fundamentally quantum process, though. And the, the interesting thing happens is because these processes, this state could have coherence initially. This state, this unitary, or this, this uh, work protocol will inevitably build coherences uh, in, the, in, the, in, the in the process. All right. We have everything, so now in the next sort of five or six minutes, 
I show you what happens now when we look at uh, this question in the context of uh, counter-diabetic control. So again, let's remember, what is the process I want to do? I have a qubit. It's uh, the Lando Zener model, so it's just got two energy levels. There's a, if I'm sufficiently far negative in the field, I have a very big energy gap between the ground state I'm starting in and the excited state. And I'm going to ramp that guy from its ground state, and I want to ramp it through the avoided crossing all the way to the other side. And at every point in time, I want to be in the instantaneous uh, ground state of the, of the Lando Zener model. <clears throat> so I can do that using the shortcut adiabaticity that, we, the, the, that I said. So I can calculate this additional control term. That means no matter how fast I'm driving the system, it will want to get excitations. It'll want to start when the energy gap gets small, it'll want to jump up into the excited state, but this additional H1 term will basically slap those excitations back down into the, into the ground state. And so the uh, evolved state is always the instantaneous eigenstate, instantaneous ground state of the original Hamiltonian. So you could say, well, okay, well, what happens if I look at something like the average energy? Everything here is done as a unitary process. So the change in energy is just gonna be the change in work. Naive, or uh, obvious, I think, in some sense, is if I just look at it at the level of the bare Hamiltonian, the original Hamiltonian, neglecting the fact, sort of sweeping under the rug, the fact that I'm doing control, then it's sort of obvious that by construction, this evolved state is exactly the, the uh, ground state, is exactly the eigenstate. Therefore, I will see that it's just the, the adiabatic work being done. This is what should happen because the, the, the evolved state is precisely mimicking an adiabatic dynamics. So by definition, this should give me the adiabatic work. Less obvious though, is if I more carefully think about, well, what is the actual average work for the process I'm doing? I calculate the average work with respect to the total Hamiltonian by total generator. And here, this is not obvious, right? Because this Hamiltonian, this, the, this eigenstate now, sorry, this, this evolving state, it is the ground state of H1, or sorry, of H0, it is not an eigenstate of H0 plus H1. So it is not obvious that whenever I calculate the, the average energy all the way along this dynamics that I also see exactly the adiabatic work of the original Hamiltonian. This, is, this for sure for me was not, was not obvious. What this though then means is that if I look at just at the level of the first moment of the, of the work, so of that probability distribution that we look at here, it means that the system has no idea that it's being controlled at the level, level of the first, the, first, the first moment. It doesn't know that you're doing anything at all. But we know, and there has been much work of the last couple of years, that control is not for free. We should assess what the resources necessary are. And what I'm most interested in is the thermodynamics. So how do we remedy this? And in fact, uh, it was first done a little bit in this paper by Ken Funo and all in 2017, and then um, what I've been looking at recently is, well, let's look at the full distribution. Let's calculate that thing for a two-level system doing unitary dynamics. This is bordering on trivial, so it's very easy for me to do, and we see some, some nice, interesting insights. For control, one major advantage I find here is that actually the control dynamics, particularly the, the shortcut adiabaticity, this counter-diabatic driving, allows for a lot of simplifications in this work distribution. For start off, I'm starting in the ground state. So by construction, that first energy measurement goes away. It's just, I'm in, already in an eigenstate. I'll just get the initial ground state energy. Then by construction, the control keeps me in that instantaneous eigenstate. So I know what this evolved state is. All I need to do is calculate the overlap with the eigenstates of the total Hamiltonian in order to calculate my work distribution. So I do this, and I look at the control dynamics, and now what I see is that in the early time dynamics, the, the, if I calculate the work done, this ends up corresponding to exactly the, uh, the, the, the ground state, the change in the bare Hamiltonian's ground state energies. But as I approach the avoided crossing, I see that the distribution becomes more complex. So this is calculating this work distribution with respect to the full generator of my dynamics. And I see signatures of where the control is really kicking in. Something interesting is happening in this region where in the, the work done with respect to the actual generator is showing clear features of the, of the control at play. Again, what is not obvious, what's surprising is if you take the first moment of this distribution, the average, it is exactly the ground state energy of the Burr Hamiltonian. I find that quite remarkable, but 
when you look at the distribution itself, there are fingerprints of the control present. So now, where does the kibble zero kick in? Well, there's some transition here between what looks adiabatic versus what looks uh, where the control is, is, is necessary. So the distribution is a, is, a, um, is a classical probability distribution. So it contains some information. So why not calculate the entropy of it? That's pretty much what my motivation was here. And so if I calculate the entropy, which gives some notion of the complexity of the, of the work distribution that I have, what I see is that there's big regions where it is basically zero, uh, and then regions where it does something interesting as a function of the quench duration, of how fast I'm ramping the system. So this axis here is basically saying, how violently am I ramping the system? Am I ramping it really, really fast, like instantaneously, or really slow, which is, which is approaching the adiabatic limit? We see there is a clear transition, very reminiscent of what the kibble zurich mechanism was saying. It was telling us there's a, a distinction between adiabatic and impulse regimes. This is showing up here for the controlled dynamics. Remember, we have, in some sense, in terms of the original Hamiltonian, no excitations being generated here. Only at the level of the total Hamiltonian do we really see some, some interesting stuff. And we can make it more, more concrete, so uh, I will wrap up shortly. The, if we look at the actual transition here, this is a, by eye, it looks like we're getting something like kibble Zurich, but we can make this much more rigorous. There are uh, correct critical exponents and various things that we can calculate. And if we check how the entropy of the work distribution scales as a function of this ramp duration, we get exactly what the kibble Zurich predicts. So the takeaway message from this is essentially saying that, as intuition, I think, dictates, yes, control does give an awful lot of information, not just about being able to achieve a particular process, but also it tells you an enormous amount about the path not taken. In particular here, it captures exactly the non-equilibrium dynamics that you are avoiding. Um, because of this, because this has no, the, the, how well this works has no dependence on whether, what this function is, uh, you can then do this for arbitrary types of functions and it makes it a little bit more, uh, a bit more versatile. So I was going to say something about complexity, but I will skip that last slide and just wrap up to say you can read a little bit more about it in this paper. But the main takeaway for me is just that control is more than just a means to an end. It allows us a really versatile window to study, I think, a plethora of other things, in particular for me, something like non-equilibrium dynamics, by just finding the right question to ask of the system. So with that, I uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Do we have questions for Steve? <laughs> we, we can pass. I, I have the feeling I'm going to ask this question a lot throughout this conference, um, but kind of the same question to you as to Brigada earlier. How extensible is this to other systems? Uh, so the control term itself, ish. <laughs> so a single qubit, so the problem is that you have to solve the model exactly, right? So you need to have access to the full spectrum, which almost rules it out for all but the simplest model. So we've calculated these control terms for like the easing model and for other like uh, exactly solvable spin systems. Um, but there are some really nice recent work where you can use the framework here and then say, okay, what if I have a, a complex many body system? I can get some insight from the counter-diabatic control term as to what are likely the important operators that enter into the control. And then I can say, okay, well, what's how good can I do if I only restrict to like single body or two body controls? And it's starting to give you a bit of insight into what the, uh, what the relevant kind of control knobs are to, to tune. So I think whether or not these, and also whether or not these uh, control terms it predicts are necessarily experimentally implementable are, again, a bit of a question. If you look at this for an n-body system, you'll get these mad n-body terms. But again, it tells you something interesting, I think, because you can look at that and say, well, if I want perfect control, I need some non-implementable control terms. But if I, how close can I get to that by, by truncating that and looking at something more relevant, right? So you can, it, I think it starts giving you some very, very nice insights by just sort of turning the question on its head and saying, well, even if I can't implement this, it maybe can tell me what sort of things are most relevant for me to apply. So directly scalable, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think it can tell us something.